Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we share wisdom and practical tips to help you grow stronger in all areas of your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who offer real world experiences that you can apply to your own journey. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm Meredith Bell, your host, and I am committed to interviewing guests who will both inspire and challenge you. And that I can promise is going to happen today with my very special guest. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to rate and review it on your favorite podcast platform. My podcast is brought to you by my company, Performance Support Systems. We publish software tools and books for improving the way people communicate with each other at work. And you can learn more about them at growstrongleaders.com. Today, I am really excited and I have to say honored, Robin, to have as my guest, Robin Rosenberg. Robin, welcome to my show. Thank you so much for being here, Meredith. I've been looking forward to it. Well, you know, Robin, I was just compelled to invite you to be a guest after hearing you on another podcast and then, um, you know, checking out your website and some of the things you're doing in this world. I think they're really important for the time that we're in. And so I want to set the stage for my listeners by giving your more formal introduction before we jump into the many questions I have for you today. Robin has a unique combination of talents. She's a clinical psychologist and has had both a psychotherapy and coaching practice in San Francisco Bay Area, as well as New York City. Here's the thing, though. She's also been interested for many years in virtual reality, also known as VR, and she was the lead author of a study to investigate using VR for good which I think is so fascinating. She has combined her interest in this technology with her coaching and clinical experiences. And so she has formed this company. She's the CEO and founder of a company called Live in Their World. And her goal is to foster in employees and leaders a deeper understanding of how and why other people may feel slighted or marginalized, and how to approach such interactions differently. Live in Their World is a program to help everyone in a company become more sensitive to bias and its effects, and to develop more respectful and productive ways to interact with each other. And if you've been living in this country for very long in the last few years, you know that this is such an important area that needs attention, I believe, in our country. So, Robin, this is going to be a very special conversation, and I'm just so grateful to have you with me today. I am happy to be here. Uh, As I said, I'm very excited to talk well, with you. let's get started by having you talk about your unique combination of strengths and interests that led to you um, forming this company and how your background as a psycho- psychotherapist has influenced the work that you're doing in Live in Their World. Sure. So um, just for, for that background, Often in psychotherapy, you know, some of what people talk about is related to work. So um, for many years, I have been helping people with their work relationships um, and helping them figure out how to address things that were happening at work, uh, both in psychotherapy and in coaching practices, although coaching is somewhat of a different emphasis. Um, and also just uh, the psychotherapy practice has helped me more deeply understand how people from different demographic groups or diff- you know, of, of any kind um, it can experience things differently. 
right? So if you're 25 versus 50, right, you're going to experience the same incident or the same situation will, will be experienced differently if you're a different gender, or if you're a different race or ethnic background. So that was um, part of what helped me become interested in doing something in the workplace space. The, uh, the other piece of me as a psychologist and one of the many hats that I wear is I also write psychology textbooks, including introductory psychology. Some of your listeners may have even had that book or the <laughs> abnormal psychology book <laughs> that I that I co-wrote. Um, it, but what that did is it helped me have a both deep and broad understanding of human nature mm. and and uh, an appreciation of the science of what we know in psychology and of course what we don't know um, and the ways to really harness the science to help people. We spend so many hours of our lives at work. You know, it was really, how can we make work a better place to be, even if we're working remotely? Mm -hmm. So the, the original idea for Live in Their World came because I was doing some research in VR, collaborating with a psychologist at Stanford when Trayvon Martin was killed and then George Zimmerman was acquitted and that led to uh, you know, a big surge in, uh, for Black Lives Matter. And then on the news, we were hearing some white people saying white lives matter or all lives matter. And n- not that I presume to know the lived experience of being Black in America deeply, but I, at the time, I thought that perhaps if we could use VR to really give people the, an immersive experience of what is it like to be Black in America, right? They, that it was a failure of understanding, if you will. Uh-huh. Um, and that you can read about it, but it's, it's really not the same no. as, as being um, in someone's position in real time. So that was the idea. And that was what led to the program that we have now. And I'm really excited because one of the things... That, that we know is uh, a lot of what we call one-off interventions or one and dones. you know, a lot of DEI training um, isn't helpful. Even, even if it's really engaging and people are really fired up, you know, it's like learning a language, you need help, you need practice with it over time. And so um, you need someone helping you to correct your accent or your grammar and, and, and we have a, a language that we want people to speak to each other, right? A language and a grammar, right? The way a pronunciation, if you will. And so one and dones don't work and they can even be harmful where um, there's a phenomenon in psychology called reactance, which is when you try to persuade someone of something, they, they, they can become more deeply entrenched in their original position. Mm-hmm. They just don't, I mean, I understand that. We just don't want to be persuaded. We don't want, we don't, don't like that. So we, we cling a little more dearly. And so with any kind of persuasion, a minority of people will have that effect. And, and of course it has the opposite uh, effect of what the intended one was. Mm-hmm. So um, we, we don't really try to persuade it's, it's come and have this experience, you know, just see what that's like. And, uh-huh. um, but we do more than that because it's not an understanding is great. Don't miss up your know, understanding, empathy, all those things are terrific, but they're not enough. Right. And so, yeah, let's, let's take an example. Um, so the way your program works, people um, are going to, be put in a position through virtual reality of experiencing what it's like to be someone who's different from them. Is that right. correct? Or, or, or maybe them. Um, it depends on you know what their their demographic identity is. Uh, but we put people in the position of various and sundry um, people from di- different demographic groups, and the idea is just experience what that's like in situation after situation after situation. You know, these aren't just one-off things of like, oh, someone was a, a jerk, 
right? It, it's, it sort of comes up in all different ways and in, in all different forms. And so what is that like to carry that load? Pr- you know, pretty, not constantly, but frequently. And then we want to give people the skills of, well, how could anyone in that situation have handled it? If a yuck, if a yucky thing happens, right? There's the person who was disrespected. There's the person who often unintentionally was disrespectful. Sometimes there are bystanders that we want to help upscale so that they can say something. So how does each person, what, what is it that they can do? And all of us are going to be in all three of those positions in a given work week. Mm-hmm. We're going to be someone who feels disrespected. We're going to be someone who unintentionally disrespects someone else. And we're going to be someone who caught, you know, who saw something that wasn't so great. So, so it's really, it's the awareness and the upskilling. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we do in, in what's called distributed learning or kind of a drip method in small doses over time, because one and done's are not very effective. Right. That's been an important part of our work as well. Know, knowing yeah. that, you know, you can't send someone to a learning event. You were mentioning that before about DEI. In fact, one of the things that I noticed in one of the articles I had read about you was you really prefer to change the sequence of the letters instead of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, you had talked about EID, and I would love for you to describe why you prefer that order of the letters and also put it in the context of civility, because I know that's kind of the overall umbrella that you're really working towards is civility, right? Yeah. Thank you for that question. So we call what we do civility training because fundamentally it's about respect, right? I mean, it's just how how do we make people feel respected? So civility is um, the low level everyday, not just please and thank you, but understanding how our words and deeds and those of others impact people and adjusting our behavior accordingly. Mm-hmm. And that's the key, right? It's adjusting our behavior accordingly. And, and that's universal. The, the under, underlying principles of civility and respect are the same, no matter who the other person is. There are some specifics about what could be considered disrespectful that differ for people from different groups. But the, if you know the underlying principles of what to do are the same. So um, the reason I like EID is because it starts with equity. And really equity, in, in some sense, is fundamentally about respect, right? And it's, it's the um, equality of respect. Where everyone who's doing similar work should be paid the same, for instance, Right, people shouldn't have to fight for um, an equivalent compensation package, mm-hmm. or the equal opportunity for high status work, or challenging work, or promotion opportunities. So, f- fundamentally, it all starts with equity, and it, I actually call it transparent equity because c- companies can be terrific and at the forefront and want to do equity audits, right? Pay audits and compensation audits, audits for who gets promoted or, you know, all that stuff. And that's wonderful. But if they don't share the results of how they're trying to correct for equity, then people don't know, Mm. right? Knowledge is power. If I know I'm working at a company that realized, hey, we were paying, I'm going to use an example, we're both women, we were paying women less than men for the same role with, you know, who had the same amount of experience. We're correcting that. I'm going to be really glad to be working for a company that cared enough to both do the audit and do the, do the uh, recalibration. And they told me, right? And so, and they told me it wasn't just me, they were recalibrated. Like they, they were sort of public. This is, we care about this. 
we're committed to this. Here's what we're done. Here's what we've done. Here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to keep an eye on this. That's incredibly powerful of making people feel they have an equal shot. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why I put equity first because it, it creates a more level playing field, if you will, Mm -hmm. right. For people yeah. that it feels much more of an actual meritocracy um, and then inclusion. And, you know, there's a sense in which without equity, you can't have real inclusion because the principles of equity are um, fundamental. Sort of a prerequisite, right? Yes. Exa- mm-hmm. Well, yes and no. I mean, you could fake it. We have inclusion you know, focus in workplaces where they may not have an emphasis on equity. Mm-hmm. So, but, but the it, equity, transparent equity really powers inclusion, if you will. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and it sort of systemically powers it. So then you've got inclusion and um, I put diversity last because unless you have real efforts to inclusion, Diversity becomes a, a numbers game and a revolving door. And p- why would someone stay in a place they don't feel included if they mm-hmm. have a choice to go elsewhere? And, and so people want to contribute. They want to be valued. They want to be appreciated. They, they want to make things happen. They want to do good. And so inclusion is really the prere- prerequisite for successful diversity initiatives. Mm-hmm. Um, And that's why I I do it in that order. Well, when you go into an organization that says, you know, they want to um, improve EID, DEI, and, you know, this overall civility, although it's hard to imagine somebody says, we want to improve our civility. Respect. (laughs) Respect. Yeah. What is it that is their kind of presenting problem, as a therapist might say, that that opens the door for you to come in and introduce your program? So I I think it varies. Um, Some people are intrigued by the VR just because it's a little different. Um, But I think people, they don't have to have a presenting problem in order to want to do it. I think, you know, you can be healthy and and want to feel even better. Mm-hmm. I would that think that's sense. even the the more ideal situation for you, a company that is interested in up leveling what they're doing, as opposed to a company that hasn't done anything in the past and is more in a reactive mode. Well, I, you know, I, I'm actually if people really if organizations want to change it doesn't matter to me what phase they're in, in the sense that motivation counts for a lot. And we know that when leaders really um, consistently convey to their folks, their, their passion and desire for inclusion, for respect, for equity, for, diver- you know, whatever belonging engagement, mm-hmm. it percolates down. Because when leaders say to the, their direct reports, when they have managers and they say to their managers, hey, what are you doing about inclusion? You know, what's happening with your folks? What's happening in team meetings? Are people feeling heard? You know, how do you know? When leaders ask those kinds of questions, they're signaling, I care about this. And so you should care about this because, you know, I'm asking you about it and I'm going to keep asking you about it. You know, and if compensation is pegged to that, wow, isn't that even more powerful, right? That your compensation as a manager or your performance review, your opportunity for uh, professional development here is pegged to, so how are your people feeling about their team? That's incredibly powerful. So I, I, even if there's been not great culture, if if leadership decides, you know, this is really important both for retention, as we're seeing a lot of people quitting or contemplating quitting. Um, and so this is a retention tool um, or just all of the data show that when people feel engagement and belonging and appreciated, everyone 
is happy. I mean, they're more innovative, they're more creative, great problem solvers, you know, they have better sales. I mean, whatever the domain is, whatever um, the metric would be, the teams do better. Mm -hmm. So when you go into an organization, because I really want to paint a picture for uh, my listeners on how your program works, do you give some kind of orientation to help them understand what it is they're going to be experiencing? Or is that all part of, you know, what's built into your program itself? I see. Well, so we, there are a bunch of different ways to do it. It depends on the size of the organization. It depends on what they've already communicated. And we're happy to help um, with communications to, um, you know, to the comms team in, and what to say. But ideally, leadership would, would start our program first because they, we, we want them evangelizing. Yes, that um, makes perfect sense. And so, because again, we know how important it is when it filters down from the top. Yeah. And our program can often be water cooler conversation for teams as a starting off point, which is great. Um, so ideally, you know, it's with leadership, but, but let's just say it isn't or, or where leadership is already done that again, working with, with their folks to, for messaging about us and that they'll be getting an email from us and what, why, again, the, why the company is doing this is really part of this important part of the story, right? The storytelling of how people hear it. Um, and, and so why is it important? Is this a threat to me or not a threat? Is this something that I should be embracing? And so that's on us in concert with um, the, whatever the team is at the organization of how to present it. And then literally we get email addresses and input of, of the folks can, who are going to be doing the program and we input them into our system and they get an email inviting them. I mean, we, there's a little bit more backend stuff that happens of what timing they want our, our program because it's a drip method or distributed learning um, there are multiple pieces that organizations can pick about the timing and the order. Mm. Um, so we, we work with them just on the back end of what they prefer. We have a bunch of add-ons. Um, well, actually, let me just say in the program, we don't actually have to use a VR headset because of work from anywhere. We've um, expanded the number of ways that people can see the, the VR experience. Oh. So they can do it through an Oculus headset in the office, although, you know, Right now, that may not be optimal. They can do it in what's called mobile VR headsets, which is basically like Google Cardboard, but better. You know, they're often 25 bucks at Amazon. You put your mobile phone in it. And so, mm-hmm. but you're having a VR experience or what's called immersive video, which is it's on your computer. It's like a YouTube 360 where you can sort of move around a bit in the space. I don't know if you or your listeners have experienced that, but and that requires no special equipment. So there are three, we, three ways people can see the VR. The VR is just a part of our program. We also have other compo- components, if you will. And um, we have add-ons if companies want. We're happy to do workshops or like leadership workshops specifically around the respect, pro- you know, the program. We have additional leadership training on just in general, the concepts of leading with respect um, and leading for inclusion. We have a hybrid leadership because that has a whole other set of issues. So we have a leadership training for hybrid work groups, um, uh-huh. which are different than remote. We can also we also do remote training, but but hybrid is very unique um, because of the there are actually inherent inequities when you have people who are in the office, either full-time or some of the time, and then remote differently full-time or some of the time. And mm-hmm. um, and what I call blended employees. So I make a distinction between full-time in office, full-time remote, and blended, which are people who are some of each. Okay. Um, because, and that has implications as well. Of what, what's the staffing pattern? in a hybrid workplace. Mm -hmm. And And I want to go into the hybrid in a minute, but I would love for you to just describe a couple of clients, let's say, 
where after they've gone through their program or maybe give like a before, during, after, you know, what was the situation um, that where, where were they trying to make improvements and then what people were involved. And then after they went through your program, how were things better? How did they elevate respect? I'd love to hear more about uh, real situations with, Got it. with organizations. So um, there was one, uh, one site where we, um, so we, I should say, we, you know, data is really important to us. Collecting data is built into our program. Right. And because we, we want to know the aspects of inclusion and civility and respect where we make a difference and where there's more work to be done, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that we've heard from men um, pretty consistently is the way that they thought they understood uh, some of the issues that women have talked about and sort of complained about um, and, and realized that they didn't quite understand as well as they thought they did. Mm. Um, And that was really gratifying. So even things ranging from um, in office, physical proximity, you know, of how, where some, where a man stands relative to a woman and and sort of that physical space aspect um, to uh, the ways that women are evaluated on style more frequently than our men. Um, and, you know, the, the vague amorphous, you know, you don't have leadership. You're not leadership material enough. You're not being assertive enough, you know, but uh, intangible. It's not really about the specific behaviors of, hey, when that client was here and they mentioned X, we would love it if you would say Y, you know, more frequently or more forcefully, or, you know, speak up more in meetings or whatever. It's more this vague and, and interestingly hearing from a a lot of guys that um, they, they they didn't get it as well as they thought they had until, um, until our program. And so that's been really gratifying of that. They are much more mindful about those issues, particularly for, um, people in power. And it's not just men, by the way, female leaders are not often terrific (laughs) with respect to women working under them as well. So um, it's, it's women seeing the ways that they can also um, handicap women who are under them. Mm. Certainly. So, um, and then we had, there was uh, one, one, study where we did, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. There's a website called, um, let's see, it's harvard.edu backslash implicit. And this is a test that has many, many variations where people can, it it measures reaction time for stereotypical versus county counter stereotypical pairing of words or photographs or drawings, images. So their versions, the original version was actually about race. Um, it was after Amadou Diallo was killed in, in, in New York actually. And he had been taking out a phone from his pocket and the police thought it was a gun. I don't know if you remember, this was quite a while ago. Mm. Anyway, the test has different versions. There's a version for race. There's a version for uh, gender. There's a version for politics. There's you know many versions of this test, but we were using a gender version for our um, initial proof of concept test and, and to see how people's attitudes had shifted. Mm. And we got terrific results. Uh, It was one of the two two tests that we used to measure. So, um, you know, I think it's, it depends on what um, organizations want as their goals for change. I know that we have um, one of our tracks is a black man track, right? So we, for the VR component, we, we literally put you in the shoes of a black man and experience a variety 
of work scenes from his perspective, you know, scenes that are disrespectful, often unintentionally. You know, again, it's not that people were um, set set out to be racist or, you know, were racist. They, it was just unintentional things. But again, they, they take their toll. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, we've gotten feedback about how people just didn't really know about mm-hmm. the impact. You know, they had good intent, but they just didn't really understand what the impact was on on someone else. And and that's awareness is great, right? Awareness is great, yeah. but the awareness is great because it motivates you to do the behavior change. Behavior change is hard. Right. We know this. It yes. is hard to change habits. Mm-hmm. I know that I need many trials of learning to get, develop a new habit. Right. Some people are quick learners in general. I'm not a quick learner. And so what the VR does is it really motivates you of like, yeah, I don't want to do that to another person. I don't want to put them in that position. Mm-hmm. And so we also, you know, then upskill of, okay, now I know what to do. So I make the analogy, if you give a kid crayons and they draw on the floor, it's not enough to say, don't draw on the floor. You have to say, don't draw on the floor and you should draw on paper. And here's where we keep the paper. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's what you, you need that other step, which is we draw on paper and here's where the paper is. Yeah. I like that. The idea, I, I like the whole awareness piece first, because we've got to help people become aware of what they're saying or doing that's creating an issue for someone else. I like the fact that you take it beyond that to the action phase so they get a clear picture of what something that would be respectful as an alternative way right. of being or behaving what that would be. So I love that. I think that's a very powerful combination. And I kind of get chills as I'm listening to you talk about that, imagining, because it's so hard for us since we aren't, you know, if I'm a white woman, it's hard for me to imagine what a black man, a black woman, an Asian woman, you know, someone who is very different from me, what they experience. So I like the fact that you have created these scenarios to help make that more real, more concrete for someone else. Right. And we're also, you know, we're also just trying to help upskill people just what to do if I see it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I mean, because that's really hard too. And we're also trying to upskill people of, so if someone says something to me about, you know, I did or said something inadvertently, how should I respond? And the answer yeah. is, of course, not defensively, but but it we're trying to help people have that open and curious growth mindset. Yes. That we know yeah. is really important in the work world and, and really anywhere um, to, you know, oh, oh, this is a learning opportunity for me to learn about you and to learn about me and how if we can talk this through and I can actually come away with new tools it deepens our trust in each other and yeah. it improves me in my professional and personal growth. Well, you know, the other thing, just as I'm listening to you talk about this, it seems to me this makes the case so strongly for the top leadership to start first because mm-hmm. they've got to have that awareness and, and knowledge and then application of what needs to be done so they can model it for others, not just talk it, but actually walk it. And, and the other piece of what you're saying to me that's so important is this whole thing of making it safe for others to be open and honest, to receive that information, but also to speak up because when you have the, and I know you've seen this over the years, you know, when there's an unhealthy culture for whatever reason that where people don't feel safe speaking up because there's repercussions or there's, you know, negative impact of, of being honest and speaking up, that's a habit that has to be changed over time as well to, 
to exactly. you know see the opportunity, but then all, and and not only knowing what to say, but feeling comfortable saying it. It's a combination of things going on there. Right. It it's um really important for leaders in particular, but for everyone to learn how to take feedback. Yes. You know, our, our culture is not particularly great on that. <laughs> and, um, and it's not just, okay, thank you for the information, right? That That's not, that's, that's just listening, but not really taking feedback. Taking feedback is taking it in. And even if you don't agree with the feedback, there, there are steps you can take. First of all, it's telling you something about the other person that's important for you to know because yes. they're, they're, they're making themselves vulnerable yes. and coming to you because it's important to them. And we all have blind spots. Mm-hmm. You know? And so that's where you, hey, tell a trusted friend or colleague, someone said this to me, what do you think? Like, yeah, is this, does this ring a bell to you about me? You know, it's helpful to get that feedback, but you have to be open to it. Yes. So we do a lot of in our um, in our leadership or training series or workshops. We do a lot about feedback, about mm-hmm. giving and taking feedback respectfully. It's an art. It is. In fact, um, my business partner Denny Coates and I wrote a book, "Connect with Your Team," and one of the chapters is on feedback, and we call it receiving feedback graciously. I love that because it's that whole idea of seeing it as a gift instead of somebody pointing out my flaws. And it just makes such a difference with that attitude. And again, I like your emphasis on the growth, you know, mindset and the curiosity. If you can respond with curiosity, asking someone to tell me more instead of reacting defensively and shutting it down. Right. right. It's that whole thing of creating a, an environment where people feel respected enough to totally. be honest with each other. So I love, you know, how we're right. coming kind of full circle with this. Right. We, we also do executive coaching. And I know, you know, sometimes with high performers in particular who have been um, used to, um, I don't know, uh, they, they're used to being praised and they're they're often they're not used to getting feedback for something that isn't kind of in, what they view as in their bucket, right? You know, it, it, they're for style issues or you know for how they are interacting with people above, below, at their level, and and so you know the coaching can really help them shift their mindset to really that growth opportunity. Um, and, and making them a better employee who's more, even more highly valued mm-hmm. because of the ways they can bring people together instead of splitting them apart. Yeah, that's great. Well, you know, one of the other things I love on your website is you have this uh, Dear Robin column that you <laughs> yes. created. And uh, in fact, after I heard you on the podcast, I read I went and read a bunch of those because, um, and I encourage my listeners when I ask you to share your um, contact information tell them your website, because on this column, you have real questions from people, you know, in the workplace and your responses to me are so realistic with, you know, your, it's not pie in the sky. It's based on reality. So talk about why you started that. And then you also have a podcast that you I do. Started. So thank you for, for that. Um, so the, I started the Dear Robin column because um, I, people who um, meet me it's kind of like being a doctor where, you know, Hey doc, Hey, you know, Hey Robin, I have this question. But so people would ask me their, their work related questions. What should I do? And uh, you know, I'd give them answers and I'd ask them how the feedback went and what happened and and get follow up and and they found it really helpful. And so I thought it was a way to um, do the same thing on a, on a bigger scale, because most likely any question someone has, there are multiple people who have that same mm-hmm. issue that they're struggling with. So it, you, people can submit questions anonymously through the website. If you have any work-related respect questions uh, that you want answered. And then the podcast we started because I was doing a bunch of podcasts and it, I wanted to, um, 
hear from people have guests on where the specific focus was around that the sort of civility respect um, and also risk mitigation. I mean, very interested in, in DEI work or risk, you know, civility and respect work as risk mitigation, Mm -hmm. because I think people don't think of it that way, but it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our, our, actually our first guest was an attorney so we, we spent some time talking about risk mitigation and that was fun. That was really interesting. Oh, that's great. Well, I think there's so much more we could discuss, but in, for the sake of time today, I think we're going to need to wrap up. So what I would love for you to do is let people know how they can connect with you and then tell us about your website where they can find all these wonderful resources. Sure. So people can connect with me on LinkedIn Robin Rosenberg, psychologist, I'm, I'm the only one, um, or live in their world and on, on LinkedIn or Twitter. And uh, on the website is liveintheirworld.com. And there's under, I think under thought leadership, you'll find things I've written both um, for other people. No, that, yeah. Things I've written on our website, on other people's websites, there are blog, our podcast episodes, the um, newsletter. There's a ton of stuff. They're just go to the website and tool around. There's there's a lot there. I think on the news page is other other places that I've written articles that have been published. So or other podcasts like this one will be on there. That's great. Well, I'm so grateful to have you on my program today, Robin, because I think the work you're doing, like I said in the opening, is so important. This idea of creating civility, where we see in the news all the time, that's not happening. And yet, you've got such a, a, I think, a powerful and profound program that you have created to really have such a positive impact in this way, one company at a time, one person at a time. So I just want to thank you for the creativity you brought to this whole topic in putting together your, you know, coming together with your background and this virtual reality and what you've been able to create and implement with organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a what a lovely thing to say. I so appreciate your inviting me and just getting to know you. And I look forward to more. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com slash free and grab our ebook, Listen Like a Pro. You'll find out how to connect on a deeper level with the people who matter to you. And while you're there, check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.